you are complicated. And no, I don't just mean that you like Dungeons and Dragons and 90 Day Fiance at the same time. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. No, I mean that you as a system are very complex. You are an incredible array of interactions between cells and proteins and atoms and molecules. Mathematically speaking, you are very complicated. And being a complicated being, you can use your ingenuity to make other very complicated things, like the computer in your pocket that's never more than two feet from you that's selling your personal data to Facebook, and things like games. One of these games, however, is so complex that it would take longer than the age of the universe to finish it. Oh, this is a good hand. Now entering the facility. The moment you have some system with many different components interacting in many different ways, that system starts to get complicated. Your brain and all of its neurons interacting together is very complicated. Ant colonies are complicated. Supercomputers with sentience are complicated. What up? But those are very obvious examples of complexity. You can find it in less obvious places too. In what feels like a lifetime ago, I showed you the most complicated board game known to science. Magic the, Ga Magic the Gathering, I guess I don't have access to that video anymore, but what I did was show you a real deck of Magic the Gathering cards that could operate using the game's own rules as a Turing machine, a simple computer, and it was rather amazing. A few pieces of cardstock that could theoretically compute anything, but at the time I wasn't able to show you anything actually being computed. Well, that brings us to today. But first, let's do a quick recap before we jump headlong into things. A Turing machine is a theoretical construction of the simplest kind of computer, something that computes, first conceived by the father of modern computer science, Alan Turing, in 1936. The original idea consisted of three elements. First, a tape that extended infinitely in each direction. Remember, this is all mathematical and had some spaces on it where you could put some symbols. The second element was a head that could read, write, and erase symbols based on the third element, a program that the computer would follow. The computer could also have multiple different states, but we'll leave that alone for now. What a Turing machine does is take some input on the tape, follow the program, and then give us some output to read later. It's incredibly powerful. Let's watch one at work right now. Computer science has come a long way since 1936. Today, you can just go online, find a Turing machine simulator, and mess around with it. This one is going to perform unary addition. It's gonna take two binary numbers, in this case, eight and two, and it's gonna sum them together for us. When we run this Turing machine, you can see the head going along the simulated tape, reading, writing, and erasing according to the program you see below. And then it gives us some output, which is 10 in binary. Now, this seems simple, and it is, but it's incredibly powerful. Any real-world computation can be performed on a Turing machine like this, but not all Turing machines have to be digital. Which brings us back to Magic the Gathering, my nerdy hobby of choice. In a previous video, I took this paper by Dr. Alex Churchill and his colleagues, and I constructed what they recommended as the real-world Turing machine deck. But at the time of that video, I couldn't even show you one plus one because the researchers themselves didn't know what it would look like in terms of tokens and board states, what have you. Well. I'm glad to say that that time is now, and if you thought cardboard was complicated before, You know, it's not that hard to find a game that can simulate a Turing machine that is so-called Turing complete. As we said when we first looked into this concept, StarCraft, Minecraft, and even Minesweeper can simulate a Turing machine. What's impressive about Magic the Gathering, though, yeah, it's a car with my face on it. What's impressive about Magic the Gathering, though, is that so far it's the only offline game we know that can simulate a Turing machine, that can theoretically compute anything. And because of that, there are board states in Magic the Gathering that can literally present an infinite set of possible moves to a player, which makes it mathematically as complex as a game can be, more complicated than chess or go. And all of this just thrown at a player by some cards. Good one. Let me see your badge. Don't you run away from it. 
The last time we talked about the Magic the Gathering Turing Machine deck, where I was explaining the cards and their interactions and the four turn cycle and how everything worked with my friends from the Command Zone, Jimmy and Josh, I had everything laid out nicely on an average size kitchen table. But in truth, that was really only possible because we didn't really know how many tokens we would actually need. The researchers didn't either. We didn't know that. We didn't know how many dice we would need. So I shortcut everything to make it fit nicely on a table and in a video. So how big of a table would you need to run the Turing Machine deck? How long would a game actually take if you wanted to do something like eight plus two and get an output that showed something that looked like 10? Well, that's where honorary facility member Jan Biel comes in. Biel was able to take, using computer science on the level of ARIA, the original Magic the Gathering Turing Machine paper, code, calculate, and run everything himself to give us the numbers and the math that we are looking for. Please go watch Jan's full video. It's over 20 minutes long and he does a wonderful job describing everything. It's in the description of this video. But for now, I want to show you the longest game in the universe. In his analysis, Jan created a Turing machine that could compute 2 plus 3. He then, through some very clever transformations, put this in the language of the Magic the Gathering Turing machine from the original paper. You should watch his video for all that fancy work. But he found that you'd need a slightly larger table than I used. <laughs> to do this. The average Magic the Gathering card is about 63 millimeters wide. This means on the average kitchen table, you might be able to fit 25 or so Magic cards or card tokens perfectly side by side. To compute two plus three in a game of Magic though, you would need a table over two and a half thousand kilometers long. And if you were at one end of it, it would take the best human marathoner five days to reach the other side. On top of this table would be sitting almost 41 million creature tokens for our tape. And if you stack them on top of each other, they'd be over two times taller than Everest and weigh 72,000 kilograms. <laughs> but this is just all the token stuff. Actually playing this game would be a creature type unto itself. Recall that to make our physical Turing machine work, we need to go through a number of steps. And those steps involve going through a four turn cycle of a Magic the Gathering game and manually placing a lot of plus one plus one counters on our creature tokens. These counters signify where the head of our Turing machine is and what that head will be reading, writing, or erasing. Now, most Magic the Gathering nerds like me use this to denote a lot of counters, a D20, a dodecahedron. So each one of these can put up to 20 counters on one of our creatures. However, with like 40 million tokens, that means a lot of dice. Add it all up with millions of powers and toughnesses, you would need, in terms of D20s, about 20 trillion dice. Now, I have a lot of dice, but this is a whole nother level. I would need 1.7% of the entire planet's plastic production diverted towards me playing one game of Magic the Gathering. <laughs> Which is absolutely ridiculous. Think about someone looking at a spreadsheet somewhere and be like, what? 2% of all plastic is going to what? <laughs> or, or like me getting on the phone and being like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, all the plastic. <laughs> So when you have tens of millions of tokens and trillions of dice, how long would it actually take to play a game of Magic the Gathering where we both win and compute something like two plus three? Well, as Jan estimated with me while we were emailing back and forth, it would take around 17 trillion turns. And remember, during those turns, we are going along the table manually, switching all the dice, indicating all the counters. If all of these little interactions, if we were quick about it, and they only took maybe a second, a single second on average, to play this game, and for it to finish, it would still take eight years, 84 ye 800 and 8.4 trillion years. <laughs> that is 600 times older than the universe. Just, just 
think about this timeline for a second. I sit down from you, across from you, at a table, and I take out this deck of cards, and I go, okay, so what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna exile your hand, you're gonna do nothing. So I'm gonna grab Rotten Lung Reanimator, and I'm gonna start bouncing this uh, to my hand, uh, and Karn is gonna set up, and remember, you have no hand, you can't do anything. Step, I just have to make sure I switch the power and toughness on the five million, five million fairy 2,000 miles over there. So just one second. Oh, my, oh, my bones. Oh, my little bones. Position confirmed. Interceptor deployed. Reconstituting the administrator. <gasps> oh! Oh, I knew that protocol was a good idea. Obviously, a physical Magic the Gathering Turing machine is wildly impractical, even more impractical than I first thought when I was researching this topic. The point is, it's possible. Sure, the sun would have burnt out many times over by the time you finished a single game, but uh, hey, it's possible. A game that can compute anything. Man, I love it. Mostly this card with my face on it. That's what I like. Until next time. Aria, what did you do with my bones? Um, what? I want to see my bones for a second. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the facility's very nerdy faculty for directly supporting the creation of this video. The main source of revenue for the facility comes from our faculty and from our Patreon. Especially today, I want to thank research assistant Michael O'Brien and visiting scholar Patrick Holt. If you want to join the facility staff and our Patreon and our Discord, where right now literally hundreds of nerds are talking with each other, giving me episode ideas and sharing photos of their pet spiders, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill or the link in the description. And if you support the facility just enough, you get your name on Aria here. And there's more and more of you each day. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, oh, my bones. Science videos today for a nerdier tomorrow. Thanks for watching. <laughs>